This thing is really quiet. See, I told you. That's saved you from that. Hello, can you hear me? Is it okay now? Hello. deal with that later. <laughs> Hi. Hi! I'm so excited to be able to introduce your next speaker. Um, I'm a huge fan of his. Uh, I really am. The guy's amazing. Um, I'm, I'm jealous of not only his height, <laughs> but of his absolutely stunning good looks. <laughs> and golden sexy voice. I just want to go ahead and say before he has to, he is not known as the thinking atheist. He hosts a podcast called The Thinking Atheist. Ladies and gentlemen, my friend, Seth Enders. Thank you and good night. Right? <laughs> I caught you guys at the end of a long and busy day. Everybody's a little tired. Everybody's a little achy. Everybody's certainly hungry. And I'm supposed to keep your attention for 45 minutes. So I'll give you a choice. So we can cut it short and do like a 20 minute thing and go have dinner. Or we can do the full enchilada. What do you want? <laughs> I, uh, before I, I get into the presentation itself, um, I first of all want to say a thank you and an apology to the host of Gateway to Reason that I'm not able to be here for the uh, entire weekend. I, I actually drove up this afternoon. I got in this afternoon from my home in Oklahoma. And uh, I'm with you guys today and tonight and then right before dawn in the morning I'm speeding home because tomorrow is and I'm not fishing for the applause but tomorrow is my first wedding anniversary so so you know I, I didn't want to have to tell everyone what did you do on your first wedding anniversary well I wasn't there I was with an atheist conference you know uh, I, I, I do add this is something I'm immensely proud of I don't know if you know my story but Natalie and I We've been together for years, but I was looking for kind of a wedding memory for us. I didn't want to do the, you know, the candelabras and the, you know, the invitations. And my family thinks I'm going to hell anyway, so they're probably not going to show up. And so we decided to go make a memory. So what we did was we uh, flew to Alaska, hopped on a little ski plane, and we flew out of Anchorage and landed on Colony Glacier and set our vows right there on the glacier. And uh, so we had us, her daughter, the pilot, and a secular officiant. And we got out on the ice at 6,500 feet. And we read our vows that we'd said to each other. And we said, I do. And we kissed and did all the stuff that you do during a wedding. And then we hopped back on the plane. There's a picture of her with the glacier in the background. And then all of us were celebrating after it was over in front of the plane. Woo! We did it. So um, the dogs didn't make the trip. True story. I, I, I only did it because I, I knew a guy who would do it relatively cheaply. I, I ain't rich. But uh, uh, tomorrow, there's a guy who's an ice sculptor who's carving a tiny little big block of ice into a small little mountain, like tiny, you know, like two feet. And he's going to come drop it in the front yard. And the gag is, well, I couldn't take you to the glacier, but I brought the glacier home to you. So anyway, that's all. I'm rushing home to do that. So if you came tonight and you wanted like something signed or you wanted to say hi or anything, please don't wait for tomorrow because we'll, I'll be cheated out of the chance to say hi to you. I will not be here. I'm leaving well before dawn. But I do want a chance to be able to, uh, to say hi. And if you want Sacred Cows, I brought some copies. That's the title of the presentation that I'm doing tonight. It's uh, patterned after kind of a, some research that I have been doing. I'm fascinated by belief, belief systems, why people do, otherwise rational people do, some of the crazy stuff they do, right? And it is, it's long been a source of fascination. I'm talking about myself in many ways. Why? I'm not stupid, right? Why did it take me so long? Why did I do these irrational things? How many people in this room have a fear of snakes? A lot of people out there suffer from this phenomenon. 
Phidiophobia, the fear of snakes. I totally understand it. There is something about the snake. You know, the, the, the line of the serpent, the arrow-shaped head, those never-closing eyes, right? The forked tongue. The mouth, the mouth of the snake always looks like it's smiling. And if, of course, it's the, uh, the, the venomous snake, well, you know, inside you've got the fangs. You know, in the book I called them a venom-filled syringe of doom. We are terrified in many ways of snakes. And apparently this fear that you and I have has an evolutionary origin. There were some researchers at the University of California's Department of Psychology, uh, Michael Pincunas and Richard Koss, and they did some studies that revealed that the mere sight of a legless reptile, just seeing a snake, caused an immediate fear reaction in the primate brain. Just happened automatically. Apparently a holdover from our distant past when snakes posed a significant threat to our survival. In fact, our fear of the snake kept us alive. Speaking of the fear of snakes, folks, check out Piranaconda on sci-fi <laughs> if you ever get a chance. It's a horror classic. Do you love the way sci-fi? I think they've even had contests like, what types of animals would you like us to mesh together to make the next monster movie? It's that kind of thing. Um, if you'll check out my extremely boring slide here over my left shoulder. Um, Scientists in Brazil and Japan tested a snake detection theory. This was a theory posited by an anthropologist named Lynn Isbell back in 2007, which examined a region of our brain called the pulvinar. And neurons in the pulvinar apparently receive signals from our eyes and they immediately direct our attention to specific objects within our wide field of view. If you'll pardon my horribly photoshopped image here, this is pretty lame, but it's, I was in a hurry, okay? I mean, if you look at it, something like this, you walk out and you see the turf, you see the table, you see the chair, there's part of the house, there's the fence, and there's the snake, your eyes will lock in almost immediately to the snake. In fact, if this is true, we should probably be thanking the snake because if Professor Isbell's data is correct, snakes are one of the primary reasons that we higher primates have superior vision and larger brains. Snakes made us smarter. Well, actually, snakes made some of us smart. <laughs> there is, my friends. Did you guys read about this pastor just this week? who got bitten, refused medical treatment, and was killed. It just boggles the mind. There is an entire church culture that instructs the faithful to not only ignore their panicky pulvinar, but to actually invite venomous snakes into their homes and churches for a Sunday morning snack. These wild, weird, pulpit-pounding Pentecostals are often called snake handlers. You haven't lived, my friends, until you've looked this shit up on YouTube, okay? <laughs> it's crazy. Scattered throughout Alabama, Kentucky, South Carolina, Tennessee, West Virginia, there are right now in the freaking 21st century an estimated 125 active snake handling churches that meet every Sunday and do this crazy stuff, taking literally the words of Mark chapter 16, verse 18, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. <laughs> Sorry, it's just too easy. You know what I hate? I, when, when someone else takes photographs of you and posts them for you and tags you on social media, when you don't have that control, have you noticed you're always like, <laughs> all my photos are that way. It's terrifying. Terrifying. All right? They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover, except when they don't. <laughs> <laughs> I 
This is one of the illustrations Vince DePorter did for the book. I just thought, I told him, I just want pastor's toe tags. I don't care what else you do with it. And so he threw the cross on the tag. You guys have seen this guy's story. Pastor Jamie Coots of the Full Gospel Tabernacle in Jesus' name in the Appalachia Hills. He was a TV star of the TV show Nat Geo's Snake Salvation. He was one of the co-stars of it. Uh, he was bitten on the hand and he died Saturday, February 15th of last year. Now, he'd been bitten nine times before that, okay? And news reports about this guy's antics just popped up everywhere. New York Times carried it, USA Today, the Huffington Post, Wall Street Journal. It terrifies me. This may be how some people in foreign countries see the United States, but uh, I guess that's just the way it is. By the way, one of the bites he had, uh, I don't know how many years ago this was, Coots was bitten on the middle finger of his right hand, refused medical attention, and essentially allowed the poison to just rot his finger off his hand. And so he preached the last several years without a middle finger on his right hand. Go figure. Well, he died. Here's what's interesting. In the wake of his father's death, Cody, his son, assumed leadership of the church and informed the Christian post that, you know, death by snake bite really isn't that bad. It's not such a terrible way to go compared to, say, a stroke or a car accident. The great wisdom of Cody Coots stuns us all. Then he declared on social media that he aspired to one day take up his father's mantle to become that snake handling minister himself. And then he begged for money, which of course is the mark of any good preacher. And then said the reason they needed the money is because the family had no life insurance and needed money to pay for the funeral expenses. Okay. Let's recap, shall we? Somebody does something incredibly stupid. It goes awry. <laughs> Rational people step in to try to do something to help, and then it is announced that the stupidity is going to continue. Is this not like somebody blowing their house up in like a meth explosion and then coming to you and asking to help buy them a new house, right? This is almost a stupid tax, is it not? And yet, humans aren't the only ones that suffer. There are charges that snake handlers often abuse the snakes, right? In fact, there were um, some Kentucky uh, herpetologists at the Kentucky Zoo who had done some research on snake handling churches and said there's a lot of evidence they just keep the snakes dehydrated and malnourished, right? They're weak, they're less likely to strike when they're weak, and if by chance they do strike, the weakness dilutes the potency of the venom. And look, somebody miraculously survives. Isn't God good? To add to the insanity of all this, it looks like in this scripture, remember, they'll take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it won't hurt them. They'll lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. Mark 16, 18 you look at a lot of mainstream Bible scholars, apparently these verses were not in the old, earl, oldest and earliest manuscripts. In fact, uh, I just took uh, one excerpt from Dr. Richard Carrier's book, uh, Hitler, Homer, Bible, Christ. It looks like uh, they were either enforged or inserted. Some second author or third author inserted the happy ending to the crucifixion story long after the fact. So the scripture that the snake handlers are using to base this insanity on wasn't even part of the earliest manuscripts of scripture. It just boggles the mind. Now many of us see this as a perhaps a healthy way of thinning the herd, right? <laughs> what's, that, uh, what's that meme on the internet that says, let, I'm not saying let's kill the stupid people, I'm just saying let's remove the warning labels and let the problem sort itself out for the good of the species. <laughs> Just let them filter themselves out of the gene pool for the betterment of the rest of us. All right, whatever. But I'm more interested in something else, how 21st century human beings in the age of enlightenment can think that that is sacred. How does this happen? Let's stick with the biblical God for a moment and let's explore yet another sacred tradition, my friends, the Sabbath. <laughs> I 
<laughs> Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. As God rested on the seventh day after the creation of the world, so his chosen people are charged to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. During the Sabbath, labor is prohibited. Specific types of labor called malacca. 39 categories of creative work that are referred to in the Torah, all right? 39 different types of work, which include plowing, planting, cooking, combing, shearing, weaving, sewing, slaughtering, tearing, cutting, writing, carrying, kindling, extinguishing, etc. Now, specifically, it's kindling and extinguishing that I find fascinating in this instance. For 25 hours, from Friday evening, just a few minutes before sunset, through Saturday night, you can't even cook a meal in the oven if you are an observant Jew. Let's say, hang on just a second. Let's say you want to cook a Sabbath meal. You turn on the oven. The turning of that oven knob constitutes an action. That action, the turning of the knob, will offend the great kosher chef in the sky, okay? Fortunately for you, my friends, appliance manufacturers have addressed the challenge with a special feature called, and I'm not making this up, Sabbath mode. And if you look on the appliances you have in your homes, if they were purchased in the last, let's call it five, eight years, I would wager your appliance has a Sabbath mode on it. With Sabbath mode engaged on your appliance, no lights, digits, solenoids, fans, icons, tones, or displayed can be activated during the Sabbath. They're removed as an option and disabled outright. There are organizations like Star K, which will ensure the necessary functions of your home appliance are properly disabled on the Sabbath, and they will certify you, making you and your kitchen appliance kosher certified. Now, for those who are curious as to exactly what I'm talking about with kosher, uh, it's from the Hebrew word kashrut. It means suitable or pure. Observant Jews essentially believe you are what you eat, right? And the laws of the Sabbath comprehensively legislate what you are and aren't allowed to eat. And here's just a, a little dip into that pool so we know what we're talking about, okay? Kosher meat is limited to cattle and game that have cloven hooves and chew the cud. If a split-hooved animal does not chew the cud, you don't chew the animal. Meats are to be processed in a very specific way that removes certain forbidden fats and veins, and I just thought this was interesting. Here's an actual product for sale to observant Jews, beef franks in a blanket by Hebrew, International, or Hebrew National. I don't know if you can see the tagline. It says, we answer to a higher authority. <laughs> Dairy products must come only from kosher animals. Meat and milk may not be combined for the command of Exodus 23, 19. Eggs must come from kosher birds and contain no blood. Acceptable fish must have fins and scales and you have to trim them with a kosher knife. Shellfish is forbidden outright with the command of Leviticus. Whatever hath no fins nor scales in the waters, that shall be an abomination unto you. Especially on the Sabbath. By the way, it reminds me of this awesome website put together by some dudes who, if they're not atheists, they're still just awesome. They did the website, God Hates Shrimp. <laughs> shrimp, crab, lobster, clams, mussels, all these are an abomination. Just as gays are an abomination. Why stop at protesting gay marriage? Bring all of God's law into the heathens and the sodomites. We call upon all Christians to join the crusade against Long John Silvers and Red Lobster. <laughs> Yea, even Popeyes shall be cleansed. <laughs> the website's tagline, pinch the tail, suck the head, burn in hell. <laughs> Fruits and vegetables 
Grown via soil plants or trees are fine, provided you didn't harvest them from a field that contained two different types of seeds. They must be checked for multi-legged insects that break the kosher code. Yes, the most powerful being in the universe cares what kind of bugs crawl on your vegetables. Wine must be fermented only with certain enzymes and come from a kosher winery that prepares every bottle under strict rabbinical supervision. Rabbis supervise the wine. The list of requirements goes on and on and on and on, and it's freaking exhausting. And on top of the food restrictions, you can't even crank up the oven to cook something or reheat something on the Sabbath. Now, for the more progressive Jew, <laughs> who is allowed to turn knobs. Okay? There is a device for your kitchen appliance, and again, I'm not making this up. It's called the tweaker. <laughs> Produced by Torah Technologies. When the tweaker is activated during the hours of the Sabbath, it disables all digital functions all indicator lights, and make sure that everything that normally would be done digitally is done manually. And then it delays the heating of the oven after the turning of the knob, right? Turn the knob at 11 a.m. on Friday, the oven then warms up at 11 a.m. on Saturday. Congratulations, Jews, you've just outsmarted the God. <laughs> continues. During the Sabbath, oven light bulbs have to be unscrewed from the appliance because the closing of a circuit constitutes kindling, one of the forbidden pieces of work or action in the malacca. So to keep the oven kosher, you are required to unscrew the oven light for a period of about 25 hours. I had Vince do this illustration for the book. He says, my bulb isn't dim. And she said, I beg to differ, right? <laughs> now, in Judaism, like Christianity, sin is the focus. We don't want to sin. We want to be obedient. We don't want to find ourselves in sin. We're fallible humans born with original sin. We need to purge ourselves of sin. This brings me, of course, to another sacred tradition practiced and perpetrated, for lack of a better word, by Orthodox Jews. It's called... Caparot, and it requires the use of a live chicken. Yom Kippur is also the Day of Atonement, this sacred Jewish holy day. And caparot is done usually on the day before, around dawn. And here's how it works. And these are actual instructions from uh, kind of an observant Jewish uh, website. First of all, you must pick out a white chicken. No one should use a black chicken. My favorite line is, nor should one use an obviously blemished chicken. Well, of course. I did a couple of these uh, in a couple of cities where I actually carried a rubber chicken in my uh, laptop case, and we did this, but I'll just pantomime it for you here. Here's how the caparote purging of sin works in this sacred tradition of caparote. You take the chicken in your hands. <laughs> And you say the first required paragraph. This is the paragraph. I'm not going to bore you with it here. Children of men who sit in darkness in the shadow of death, bound in blah, 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 blah. You say the first paragraph, all right? Then when reciting the beginning of the second paragraph, you wave the chicken over your head in circular motions three times, like so, OK? The first time you say, this is my exchange, the second time you say, this is my substitute. And then you do it a third time, this is my expiation. And then you repeat that two more times. So the chicken has to go around your head nine times. Grown adults do this. And of course, it <laughs> seems like a reasonable thing to teach to young children, right? Did you know that you were born sinful? You need to purge yourself of the sin. Here's a chicken. Let me show you how this is done. Now. This is how we atone for sin. You say this, the sins go from you into the chicken. 
<laughs> the chicken is then given to a ritual slaughterer who takes a razor blade and slices the head off the chicken. Okay? Then they take the chicken carcass and they donate it to feed the poor. Which prompts the question, if you give somebody else a chicken full of evil, <laughs> do they have to go get a fresh chicken and start the process all over again? So often it's animals, the innocent, who pay for the collective insanity of humankind, is it not? I felt that way when I was watching the Cecil the Lion story this last week, and I thought, you know, we, that's just the one we hear about. It happens every day, everywhere, and we see insanity happen, and it's usually the innocent that pay. One more quick example, and this is going to make your head literally spin. For hundreds of years, residents of a town called, uh, is, it's Brodolovo or Brodolovo, I'm going to call it Brodolovo because I'm ignorant, forgive me. They've sought to cleanse the community of evil, warn off rabies, and bring good luck and prosperity to their village through a practice they call treachin. Treachin translates literally dog spinning. <laughs> I shit you not. Yes, really. Here's how it works. People voluntarily bring their own dogs. And they put together a big post, big post, big post with a rope in the middle of it. And they tie the rope around the dog's waist, right about here. And then they spin the dog to tighten the rope until the dog goes higher and higher and the tension of the rope gets greater and greater and greater and greater until the rope can be coiled no more. And then they release the animal. <laughs> And it spins for an eternal 20 seconds before splashing into the creek or river or body of water underneath. Sometimes so disoriented that the dogs themselves drown. Now, this was banned for a short period of time last decade, but they've reinstated it because the mayor said this is a protected, sacred, and absolutely necessary practice for the villagers to be able to obtain Good luck. I cannot fathom this. Somebody somewhere looked at another somebody somewhere and said, you know, our corn crops have been rather pithy this season. Bring me some rope and a puppy. In the book, we reversed the tables. We had the dog spin the human and called it karma. We thought that was pretty good. In villages across India, in another sacred practice, they're not spinning dogs, they're dropping babies. Villagers petition the spirits for good health, long life, and the success of their children by dragging them up to the tops of uh, rooftops, tops of churches, tops of towers, usually about the age of two, and then they drop them to be caught in a sheet held out by villagers underneath. Forgive the low resolution of this photograph. Quite often the children dropping 50 feet, many times ending up with bruised or broken limbs after it's all over. And of course, they're just freaking terrified. Now these are protected, sacred traditions. Part of their cultural heritage. It's something we simply must do. The desire to appease some cosmic genie with, let's face it, some really weird fetishes don't you think? Here's another bizarre edict carried out by supposedly higher primates. At least human adults bear the brunt of the blows in Tamil Nadu during the festival of their uh, temple where they break coconuts over people's heads. Yeah, you have sympathy pain just thinking about it, don't you? It's a centuries old practice, been going on for hundreds of years. Hundreds converge at this small state in southern India to petition the gods for what else? Good luck, prosperity, long life. And they do this by asking the chief priest to just smash one of these coconuts right on top of them. Here's how it works. The holy man begins the ceremony by standing on a bed of nails and he brings the seven elders of the tribe up and he initiates them first. Boom, 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 boom. Is that seven? I hope so. 
He's got two guys next to him. One person holds steady the heads of the crushies, and the other guy next to him gives him fresh coconut ammo. And hundreds of people travel for hundreds and hundreds of miles so that they can get on their knees and wait for this guy to smash a coconut over their skull. Many times, the trauma to the head so severe that attending paramedics have to give them immediate medical attention. Some people refuse the medical attention and just sprinkle what they call sacred ash on the bleeding and open wound. It just boggles the mind. <coughs> this is sacred. This is tradition. This should be honored and protected. Of course, you guys probably watch the headlines when those cats in the Philippines decide to have themselves crucified in the name of Jesus. You familiar with this story? The annual Easter self-crucifixion ritual in the Philippines where they begin with homemade whips, many of these whips containing pieces of wood, metal, and bone, and they flagellate themselves bloody in the streets before having themselves literally crucified by guys who are dressed up as Roman soldiers. Convinced that recreating Christ's execution will bring about good luck, produce miracles for the afflicted, and show their thanks to God. I've never understood this. Essentially, they're telling Jesus that his atonement wasn't really enough. Like the sacrifice of a God just isn't enough. So every year we're going to go and do this horror to ourselves. This guy's name is Ruben Inage of the San Pedro Coutude village. This last spring he was crucified for the 29th consecutive year. I believe he keeps the nails in a jar in his house. For the 364 days he doesn't use them. And then on Easter, Easter weekend, they drag him out and he has himself pinned to pieces of wood in the name of Jesus. To literally amplify this divine comedy, I don't know if you can see it, but he's had himself fitted with a microphone just in case the people on the back row could not hear him screaming. <laughs> and this is totally true. It's become such a popular tourist attraction, people traveling from all over the world to see this craziness, that gift shops in the area actually cater to passing patrons and sell things like Crucifixion nails. Those brave, a.k.a. stupid enough to participate in this tradition are encouraged for reasons of safety and hygiene to get advanced tetanus shots and only use sterilized nails. After all, when having cold steel driven through healthy flesh for the purpose of ritual torture, it is important to exercise cleanliness and prevent any nasty infections. Now, <laughs> lest the quote-unquote mainstream religious attempt to distance themselves from things like this, you know, the desire to appease the spirits or the ancestors or divine father, let us look at the father shall we? The Holy Father, the Catholic Father, the Bishop of Rome, the Supreme Pontiff himself, the Pope. Pope Francis, following the resi resignation of Benedict back in 2013, uh, this guy was elected by a papal conclave. And during that period of, I think, five weeks, there was no Pope on the throne. There was no reigning Supreme Pontiff. There was a big vacuum in the church. And to show that there was no pope, the conclave chimney blew billows of black smoke into the sky. Only when the new pope was selected would that color change. And the 144 men, I'm sorry, 114 men in the papal conclave then selected a pope. And what they do to select a pope is they hide in these secret chambers and they cast ballots and they cant ballots. And then they burn those ballots and they go cast ballots and they count them. And then they burn those ballots and they cast some more ballots and count them and burn the ballots for a period of weeks upon weeks upon weeks as the planet waits on edge. News outlets, large and small, broadcast 24-hour smoke camps on the internet. People just left this shit up at work and just looked over occasionally to see what was going on. The planet obsessed, waiting for the moment when its color would change from black to white and allow 1.2 billion Roman Catholics to pretty much just get back to their beers and bingo. I don't know what they're doing with themselves. Why would God make this the preferred method for selecting his proxy here on earth? 
Why would God make that circus, right? Dressing them up like 11th century chess pieces, locking them up together in a room and essentially having them vote on what is his decision. Am I being punished by the devil or? Uh... <laughs> I'll give him just a second. If you guys can see the screen, you don't need to see me. Have you guys ever wondered, it's like the canonization of the 66 books of the Bible, right? We talk about the Council of Nicaea and all the different incarnations of the canonization, all the different canons that were made, and the voting on the Pope. Why would fallible humans ever have to vote on what is essentially God's perfect will. You guys ever catch that? Wonder why would we be the deciding vote on what was God's perfect will? Apparently according to the new pope God's power is limited speaking to a plenary assembly of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences in October of last year. He said this and I quote, when we read about creation in Genesis we run the risk of imagining God was a magician with a magic wand able to do anything. But that is not so. Whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. God's power is limited? Let's take a quick look at that. This is from chapter 3 of the book. God created the universe from nothing. Folks, that's conjuring. He turned rivers to blood, which is a curse. He transformed water to wine. That's a pretty nifty trick. He walked on water, that's levitation, and or the ability to fly. And he grants wishes, which means he has the power to manipulate matter, space, and time. God's been pulling rabbits out of his hat <laughs> since the dawn of time. And yet somehow God is not a magician. Does God not produce miracles? Does he not change matter, space, and time all the time? As in the phenomenon of transubstantiation? <laughs> Have you guys seen that? <laughs> Come for the crackers, stay for the Kool-Aid. I thought that's a great line, right? We know he can transform physical objects because supposedly, according to the Catholic Church, the moment you put the communion wafer in your mouth and the communion wine in your mouth, God miraculously transforms it into the literal flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. <laughs> now, I find it a little hard to take the church's word on this particular miracle, which by the way has never been scientifically measured. This is the same church that asked its members to pray to their deity's mom so that she can intercede on our behalf. Again, if God knows everything, why would he ever need an intercession by a third party to explain to us or petition for us? Right? It essentially declares a God who knows everything would require convincing. The same church that once condemned Galileo for his heretical claim that the sun didn't revolve around the earth. It's the same church that once warned back in March of 2007 that condoms could make the African AIDS crisis even worse than it already is. It's the same church that has a permanently posted no girls allowed sign inside its halls of power that has lifelong celibates giving marriage advice. <laughs> marriage, that blessed arrangement. Any Princess Bride fans in the house? I I'm glad you yelled, I can't see a fucking thing up there. <laughs> the same church that uses Demon police. And of course the same church that's played the centuries old game of hide the pedophile priest. The same church that tells non-heterosexuals that they are disordered and abusing human nature. Hello, irony alert. Does no one see the irony of anti-gay policies being handed out by fancily dressed men who do not keep the company of women and who disappear in secluded rooms together for long periods of time. <laughs> Sacred belief systems are filled with irony. The Catholic looks at the Hindu mark, right? And they say, that's ridiculous. 
but ours, that's awesome. I noticed that when putting the uh, research together for Sacred Cows, and just in my own life, I'm sure you have as well. Have you noticed that everything, uh, everything starts to look and sound the same? You know, they've got their paradise, their pain, their holy books, their deities, their spirits, their ancestors, their mantras, their verses, blah, 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 blah. They're doing an interpretive dance, usually to the same tune. Right? The people who freak out about the annual goat tossing festival of Spain, and this is a true story, every year they bring a live goat to the top of the tower and they throw it out the window. The poor terrified beast falls about 50 feet. They catch it in a sheet if they can. Sometimes the goat doesn't even survive and then they parade the thing through the city so that then the goodness can begin. Well, people who think this is absolutely crazy are just fine with the Old Testament and Mosaic law declaring that goats were required by Yahweh for the payment of sins on the Day of Atonement. In fact, they would bring two goats. One would be filled with the sin of the people, sin to the people that would be sacrificed at the altar right there, and the other would be sent off to either be killed by a predator or die of starvation, uh, perhaps thrown off a cliff and killed. And this second goat, called the escape goat, by the way, is where we get our term today, scapegoat. That's where that word comes from. Same people who say in the Christian faith this was certainly true, that fortune telling is absolutely crazy and or evil. We're just perfectly fine with fortune telling, which is all the book of Revelation really is. Just fortune telling. The people who freak out about baby tossing and say it's child abuse, they think this story is one of the most moral things they've ever heard. This is sacred. Abraham is a hero for his obedience. The same people who think this is insanity think this is sanity. This is sacred. It makes perfect sense. And as we wait for Christ's return, we look to the sky and we say, give us a sign. Show us a sign. Give us something to let us know you're here. So far, the pickets have been pretty slim. You guys seen this one? A Jesus grilled cheese sandwich is about all we've had so far. This one discovered in Mexico, right? Clouds and dreams and perishable foods have essentially defined Christ's reappearance, his second coming so far. Here's Cheeto Jesus. <laughs> potato chip Jesus. This one was discovered by Rosario Lawson in St. Petersburg. We got fish stick Jesus. We got banana peel Jesus. We got pizza Jesus. And perhaps most embarrassingly, we have dog's anus Jesus. You know, the more you look at it, right? It's a miracle. <laughs> quick, quick digression real fast. You guys remember the lady with the Virgin Mary toast? Uh, this is back in 2004. Diana Dyser of Fort Lauderdale. She saw the Virgin Mary on a piece of, uh, I guess it was a grilled cheese sandwich, and it, she made international news, right? Well, she put that sucker on eBay, and she made $28,000. And the best part about it was, is who bought the, the grilled cheese sandwich? It was Harris Casino who put it under glass and actually displayed this in one of the casinos, which is just a brilliant marketing move. And I think they may still have it on display today. So here we are down here on Earth, you know, we're jumping through all these hoops, all these sacred practices and traditions, watching, often creating huge amounts of suffering, corruption, distraction, confusion, certainly unintentional comedy in the name of what? Sacred tradition, we roll the bones, we drink the blood, we don the magic amulets, we take up the poisonous serpents, we offer up the sacrifice, we faint and we are revived so we can faint again. We blow the billows of holy smoke. And we can stop and think about all the crazy stuff humankind does in the name of sacred tradition. Look, we're like this, right? This is us performing for Yahweh or whoever. It's insane. While we wait for the sp spirits to acknowledge our sacred offerings and declare that he, she, or it has been appeased, what's the message we get back? <laughs> I 
Uh, we don't even get that much, really. We get excuses, equivocations, apologetics, not from a divine voice. We get them from a decidedly human voice. The high priests tell us that they've been hand-selected to speak on behalf of the spirit world, and their authority is sacred. It attempts to own the idea of marriage, calling its own definition of marriage sacred. A Bible filled with insanity, protected from criticism because its verses are sacred. Children at the mercy of preventable diseases because the rights of the parents who denied vaccines are called sacred. And don't get me started on the rights of children to be able to be their own people. Have you guys seen this one? This is my religion, my parents decided. Many of us know exactly what this is like. And it's tragic. Whole generations brainwashed in the name of what is deemed sacred belief and tradition. Sacred Cows highlights the less mainstream beliefs, traditions, customs, and practices in the hopes of revealing that the mainstream traditions, customs, and practices are no more insulated from scrutiny and criticism than any of the others are. And at the end of the day, everybody proclaiming their holy books are sacred, their sacrifices, their ideas, we should stand up and remind them that even a cherished or long-standing custom is not beyond examination, scrutiny, and when appropriate, ridicule. We should ask ourselves, when the sun sets on our puerile prayers and practices, do we really think our petitions have kept the stars in their proper alignment? Will we ever stop, look, listen, and ultimately just laugh at ourselves for being the pratfalling victims of our own superstitious joke? Can we summon the strength to decide we don't require a magical bauble chained around our necks, but we can create good fortune, good medicine, good deeds, good times, and goodwill through decision and action anchored in the real world. That by casting off our fearful and superstitious shackles, we can exchange blissful ignorance for a genuine, gratifying, and priceless freedom. Will we ever kick open the gates and release our sacred cows. Well, only time will tell. But until that day, my friends, I wish for all of you a life rich with love, laughter, grand encounters, tender moments, helping hands, fond memories, and perhaps most importantly, the freedom to see past and break through the restrictive walls that others attempt to build around you. They may find comfort inside the fences, but you were born to be free. Thank you very, very much, everybody. What happens now? Oh, we do Q and A? Oh, really? Well, let's, let's, make it, let's make it really fast and we'll let everybody get on with their day. Anybody have a comment? <laughs> comment or question from anybody? By the way, thank you guys for those who have to go. Thank you for coming. It was a real honor that you were here. Thank you. Anybody? I'm sorry? You know what's funny? Uh, at 60, we got off the, on the plane on the glacier and we weren't cold like at all. And it wasn't just adrenaline, it was, you didn't get a sensation, it wasn't windy. It was, it was amazing. It was amazing. So I, I do have a question. Yes. I, I hadn't heard about this thing about people self-crucifying or whatever, but something occurred to me while you were talking about the guy who'd done it like 29 times and all the, the fact that people come and pay lots of money to do tourist stuff around there, buy stuff. How do we, do you know for a fact that they're actually crucifying themselves? Yeah, yeah, they have actual holes in their hands and they yeah, pierce. Yeah, people do stuff like that all the time that turns out to be a trick, you know, I mean. No, they, it, they, 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 there are literal holes in the bones of his palm and they just pierce the flesh, right? Essentially the first time was the, was the worst <laughs> and now they just pierce through. These guys literally crucify. And you know it's an interesting phenomenon because when I see people act out like this, I feel the same way about them that I do about Westboro and some others. Um, when they are acting in humility to give attention to Christ, the whole time I'm watching I'm going, this isn't about Jesus, right? 
They are sort of self-gratifying is what they're doing. They're saying, look at me. Would anybody know Ruben and Ajay's name if he wasn't pinning himself to a cross every Easter? Of course not. So in the name of humility, he's essentially saying he's a champion of the greatest power in the universe and is acting on his behalf here on planet Earth. It's actually a very egotistical thing to do. Anybody else? Uh, that's fine with me. Let me say one thing real fast before we call it a night. Um, I always try to say this if I get the opportunity at free thought gatherings. Did anybody look at any of you when they heard you were coming or if they knew you were here would say, y'all are just going to atheist church? <laughs> anybody heard that one? Uh, there are people who are eager to paint us with a religious brand. There are also people who are eager to speak about us with religious terminology. And they have stamped a brand of ownership on doing something together as human beings. We come together to celebrate common interests, to enjoy each other, to challenge each other, to be together, to make each other better, to just have a good time. This is not a church thing. It is a human thing. And it's something that the church does very well. But what we've allowed them to get away with is they've managed to stamp a brand of ownership upon gathering for any occasion like this. And they call it a church of some kind. Y'all have people speaking a message. Do you enjoy music? Do you do this? Do you do that? And I just want to encourage you, never apologize for coming together in an event like this because this is not a religious phenomenon. This is a human phenomenon. I don't know about you, but I spend most of my time in a single studio by myself with a microphone. And while we have a huge radio audience, I don't get the opportunity to be able to hang out and enjoy time and challenge and, and laugh and hug and just remind each other that I'm not alone and I'm not crazy, right? Which in where I'm from <laughs> is the message. You know, we are here because we're better together in almost every case, better together than we are by ourselves. That we need reminding that we're not alone and we're not crazy. We, we shouldn't ever apologize for doing something that human beings do naturally. And I'd rather be a group of people, an army of people, fighting irrationality and craziness and offensive superstition out there, damaging beliefs and sacred traditions. I'd rather do that as an army than be one lone foot soldier throwing a pebble against the castle wall, doing the best I can. I'm better when you're in my life. And in many ways, you have become my family, and I appreciate you taking me into yours. Thank you for what you have brought to this conference. Thank you for what you've brought to the movement. And thank you again for having me out tonight. It's been a real pleasure. He's awesome. Yeah. Seth Andrews, everybody. Woo!